Hey everybody, welcome back to My Mondays. My name is Daryl Obera. So today we're gonna to be playing around with this file and this is a model that I got off of TurboSquid of a thermal solar reactor. So what we have is a field of mirrors that reflect the sun onto a thermal uh, receiver, it, like an object that basically gets super hot and then it carries that heat down through a liquid. I think it's actually like a salt-based liquid that then um, generates steam or something that turns turbines that creates electricity. So it's a thermal solar plant. And what we want to do is we want to replace all of these low res objects um, from this model that I've got. And again, the model came from TurboSquid with some geometry that's more high res. And the problem with that is if we tried to render this with an object, say each one of these towers has, you know, half a million polygons in it, or each one of these mirrors ultimately has half a million polygons in it, you know, with thousands and thousands of those mirrors, that would, that would just be really hard for the renderer to work with and to, uh, to load into a RAM footprint and things like that. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be loading objects on demand in the renderer using mental ray proxies. So um, it's a pretty cool workflow, and we're going to look at that this week. Then next week what I'm going to be doing is showing you a slightly more advanced way of replacing these objects using a little bit of Mel to also build up a little rig that will allow me to see if the sun is going to actually bounce off the mirror and then reflect back up onto the thermal receiver. So next week's going to be pretty cool. There'll be a lot of little workflow things that I throw in next week that, that you may or may not know about, some stuff that was changed in 2015 with some of the translation tools and things like that. And I'll throw in some cool workflow stuff um, this week also. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to get some lights in our, or a light in our scene, like a sun. So the easiest way to do that, obviously, is just to use the, uh, the sun sky system. Pretty straightforward there. So that sun sky system comes in with this directional light. And the directional light is really just a placeholder. Ultimately, this is driving, if you look at the light shape here, this light is ultimately driving a mental ray, um, a mental ray light shader. So what I'm going to do to make this look cool in the viewport is just turn on my hardware lights. Obviously, you can see that we have hardware shadows turned on here. That's because um, the ray trace shadows now actually turn on and, and get represented. If you have ray trace shadows turned on, the hardware um, viewport 2.0 will try to capture those in the form of a depth map shadow. And the problem is they look kind of kind of you know crunchy and stuff like that. So what we're going to do is we're just going to going to change this up a little bit. So if you go back to the light shape, um, the the Maya light here, you can see this is now obviously. Again, just a placeholder for that mental ray light, but I can start to change things like the actual light color. And this is only changing the look in OpenGL because ultimately this stuff gets ignored because it's all being driven by that fancy mental ray sun sunlight that's, again, tied in here in the mental ray light shader. So this stuff is just really just for OpenGL. So we'll give it a little bit of a warm tent. And I'm going to jump down here and I'm going to say, you know what? Ray trace shadows are great for my software renderer, but in viewport 2.0, I want to... I wanna, get more than 512 map on those depth map shadows and this stuff is grayed out so to, to get access to that just turn the depth map shadows back on and you can punch this up to something like 4096 and then give it you know a little bit high, higher filter size maybe something like three and i might even say you know what i don't care about the shadows way out here in the outside of the field i do want to see nice detail in my shadows maybe on the interior field here so what we're going to do is we're going to turn off that autofocus and just put that up to maybe a value of something like 2000. And you can see that now that those shadows sort of stop um, because we're not trying to spread that depth map out across the whole scene. And it just gives it a little bit more detail, you know, kind of where I want to work and see them. So another thing that I'm going to do now is after you dial that in, go back in here and turn on those ray trace shadows. Turn off the depth map shadows and turn the ray trace shadows on. And you can see that, you know, now these guys are grayed back out, but they're obviously still using those those updated attributes that we we switch there, and again, this is this is all just to make Viewport 2.0 look cooler. Um, I don't know, I do it all the time. Another thing that I actually do a lot is if I'm using the Sun Sky system, I'll go in here and I'll create uh, an ambient light. And again, I don't really care about the ambient light in my software render. I'll just put a little bit of blue in there, maybe a little more saturation. Really, what I want to do with this well, that's a little a little crazy there. Really, what I want to do with this ambient light is just have that you know raise my black so they're not pure black in Viewport 2.0. And a nice way of, of making that not show up in the software render is go back to the ambient light, um, the main node, the ambient light node, and just go to the mental ray flags section in the ambient light. It's kind of halfway down there, right? And just instead of having it being derived from Maya, just, just turn that guy off and just hit hide. So by doing that, this, this ambient light now really is just like a viewport light. It, the renderer won't, won't know anything about it because we've, we've hidden it to mental ray. So it allows me just to lift those blacks a little bit so that, you know, viewport 2.0 just looks better. And I don't know. I do that a lot. Probably, uh, probably not 
applicable to most people's workflow, but when I'm working in the app, I like it to look kind of cool and stuff. So that's why I do that. All right, so with that done, let's go ahead and turn off this plant and let's dive in here and look at this higher res piece of geometry. So this is obviously the guy that we want to get sent out to, uh, to become a mental ray uh, proxy. So let's go ahead and just render the, the straight geometry and you know see what we got here. So we render this guy out. Looks like my drives are spooling up here and load the textures in. Take just a second for it to render. So um, right off the bat, I know that I've got this, uh, because I did that sun sky system, there's going to be this double tone mapping happening right now. So let's get rid of this uh, exposure sample. So if I just hit the select button and then hit delete, I can blow that guy away. Let's re-render that one more time without that double exposure on there. And I'm going to, by getting rid of that, we you know now it's a true, uh, true raw EXR file, full high dynamic range in the viewport. And we can just, you know, kind of crank down that exposure and it starts to look, you know, it starts to look pretty cool. So that's, that's the object. So what we want to do is we want to create a mental ray proxy of this. So this is really pretty straightforward to do. All you have to do is go ahead and grab the object that you want to have a proxy for. So we're going to have a separate proxy for the top and one for the tower. So let's go ahead and get the, the tower one going. So we'll say export selection. And that's underneath file, my, my bad there. So we'll say export selection. Set it to export mental ray from your list, and then make sure that you switch, switch this. From, it'll be by unrenderable scene by default. Just switch that to mental ray render proxy. There's options in here, like how do you want to handle the um, the file paths and things like that. We'll just leave them on absolute for this. So we'll say export selection on that guy, and we'll just call it base. Uh, I don't know, base three. That's great. So we'll say export on you. Overwrite base three. And then we're going to do the same thing for the top here. So we're going to say, and notice if you look down my side view, I've got that pivot point set to um, the center of that, that sort of rod that we would use to adjust the overall, oops, let's lock that to that x-axis, the overall you know, angle of that guy, right? So we're going to go ahead and we're going to export this top out also. So we'll say export selection. And with the export selection done, we'll just call it top. And you can see that it's going to create these MI files. It's about 5 megs and 15 megs for that guy. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to get something that's going to, um, you know, carry those proxies in our scene. So we're going to create some bounding boxes to do that. So there's a couple of different workflows. Um, one of the ways, ways I like to do it is actually just take this piece of geometry and just say modify, convert geometry to bounding box. So this is great. We're going to make one bounding box. We'll keep the original. So we'll go ahead and say apply for that. Now notice that that bounding box it's pivots down here at the origin, right? It's not where that pivot is of that last object. So this is pretty cool. If we just hold down our control key and pick the top one there as our last selected object, so they're both selected, but the top is our last selected object, we go to bonus tools, modify. You can see there is copy pivot from last select. So boom, just like that, we've now got our pivot um, copied onto that bounding box from the, uh, from the other object um, that was the last selected object. So that's pretty sweet. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to grab this tower bottom and I'm just going to right mouse click or middle mouse click on the modify and as soon as you do that, what that does is that actually executes the last command that was done in that drop down which in this example brings up the, the, um, the option box for my create bounding box geometry. So what that means is if I was to go back to something like create and middle mouse button on top of that, what do I do? I did the last command that was in the create menu which in this example was create that ambient light. So that middle mouse button was added in 2015, and I actually use that. I use it all the time. I think it's pretty cool. So we've got this bounding box top. Its pivot point's been set properly. So what we want to do is we want to go to the shape node for that guy and load onto that um, this new, and we got to jump up here. Where did we save this stuff? I think it was base three. So we'll load that guy in there. And oops, wrong one. Uh, base, let's load top. All right, so we load the top in there, and then this, this next guy down here, this lower one, we're going to go ahead and load in base three. So we'll load that guy in like that. So now what we've got is um, I've got these other objects here. We'll just hide those. We don't need those original objects because all the information is going to be um, for the renderer, for the software renderer, is going to be included in those proxies that we just made. So we can just go ahead and say, you know what, let's render this guy out and see what we get. So in a couple seconds here, it'll spit out the image, and you can see that obviously it's not a bounding box at all. 
it's that underlying geometry. So this is really efficient for the renderer to deal with and actually for mine to deal with, right? Because now we've got, you know, this little rig and if I just take this guy and I duplicate it, you know, and, and send it out here, you know, shift D that guy out a few times. Shift D is the uh, hotkey for smart duplicate. After you've done one duplicate, shift D will do the next duplicate with the transforms from the last one that you just did. I think most people know that, but if you don't, it's, it's kind of cool. You know, this is going to render really efficiently because obviously it's it's not trying to export out all that geometry. You know, it's like 20 megs for each one of these little mirrors. It's not trying to export out, you know, 20. It would be like 100 megs worth of data on the export even. Um, it, it just exports out those placeholders and Mental Ray grabs those guys on demand and loads them in. So, you know, that's that's it. And obviously if we make changes, you know, to to some of these guys, something like this, they're going to go ahead and... Um, they're going to go ahead and do exactly what, what you'd expect. So next week, like I said, what we're going to do is we're going to build a, um, a fancy little rig that will allow me to see how the sun is bouncing off of these based on their angle and whether or not it's going to hit that collector. And we're going to be working with um, a little bit of Mel to, uh, to automate a few things. And then we're going to be doing some, some duplication of these guys and replacing those old mirror with these new mirrors, these new bounding box mirrors that are ultimately carrying the mental ray proxy. So thanks for checking out this week and please tune in next week because I think I think you guys will dig it. It's gonna be it's gonna be pretty cool. Cheers everyone.